<laughs> we are now in year 2018, but we are going to talk about uh, 2024, which is a long way to go, but uh, time flies fast, so uh, it's quite, uh, quite an appropriate uh, time frame to talk uh, about the future. We're going to talk about uh, European culture capitals, uh, about the culture capitals in 2004, uh, um, and we are going to talk about uh, more widely, not just the ones, uh, just the, the cities uh, in Estonia, Narva and, and Tartu, or Kuresara, or maybe also Pärnu, or maybe, I don't know, maybe Paida, I don't know. So, uh, different cities who are competing uh, and doing their bidding at the moment. Uh, but we're also going to talk about it more widely, uh, and we, for this we have uh, uh, guests here, international also. So let's get going. Uh, who we have here is Berk uh, Bahar from uh, Tartu. Hello, nice to meet you. Uh, Suvi from, uh, from Turku. Hello. From tu Tur Turku 2011. Uh, yes, exactly. The same year mm. as, um, as Tallinn was culture capital. Then uh, from Nara we have Helen. Thank you. And from I've never been introduced that I'm from Narva. It's okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it's from the Narva team. <clears throat> Do you live in Narva? Uh, well, one day a week. Okay. Yes. Uh, and Dave from uh, Vamor, who's from Denmark. Uh, but uh, I will now ask uh, every uh, panelist to give a short, uh, just really short background as to what is your background, uh, was your background before you joined the culture capital initiative in, in the respective uh, cities and, um, and, uh, and how, how you ended up doing it or doing, doing it now or back then? Berk. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm actually the, um, the head of the Tartu Department of Estonian uh, Writers' Union uh, and uh, have some uh, 20 years background in uh, cultural management, uh, various kinds of festivals, uh, uh, underground events, uh, literary festivals, music festivals. And uh, I also wrote the bid book for uh, Tartu 2011. Some people say it, it was better than Talents. Uh, but anyway, I ended up in the Creative Council of Tallinn uh, 2011, so um, I'm, I'm kind of... Uh, happy with uh, whatever succeeded there at, as well. At least now we have, uh, as a country, that kind of experience of running an ECOC. And uh, I guess it was the, the logical order of things that I also ended up uh, uh, editing the bid book for uh, Tartu 2024. Sylvie, <coughs> how about you? Yes, well, um, by now I have something like 20 years uh, experience on different management positions on culture and mm. event field. Uh, I started my 10 years marriage with European Capital of Culture in Turku in 2004. Uh, I was responsible first for the bidding phase. We had seven cities in Finland competing. And uh, then when the realization phase started in 2008, after Turku was nominated, um, I was the program director, so responsible for the program of the European Capital of Culture. And prior to that, I was already working in the culture field, so I had uh, um, I was working for an employment and marketing project called Arsnet, uh, online marketing for culture uh, entrepreneurs and artists. And uh, I also was the first managing director of, of International Animation Film F Festival in Turku in 2001. And I also have a background in as a violin player. And now my latest job after Culture Capital, this long marriage with Culture Capital, was then um, the program manager of Finland 100 last year. Helen. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Helen. Um, I am um, fortunate and honored to be part of the Narva Capital of Culture. Oh, I'm actually sitting on my microphone. Sorry. Uh, uh, proud to be part of the Narva team. Uh, originally, I am from Tallinn. Uh, I'm happy that actually from Narva, there are several team members here as well. Victoria and Georgi there are from uh, Narva City uh, and uh, Ivan Sergeyev from uh, the Narva team as well. Uh, so we have a combined team. There is um, 
that we we have we are lucky to work with Narva. But my background is that I am um, I have been in music industry um, since I was twenty. Um, I started my own company and a festival called Tallinn Music Week. Uh, that was part of the uh, one of the flagship events when Tallinn was the capital of culture in two thousand and eleven. So I kind of um, was part of the process as being a cultural entrepreneur, uh, and we kicked off the festival in 2009, so we were sort of able to develop the festival for three years, uh, sort of uh, building up to the Capital of Culture year. So um, uh, in, in that sense, I am familiar with this process from that angle, but um, as uh, for running a festival like Tallinn Music Week, uh, some of the key words for me have always been in sort of cultural entrepreneurship and internationalization and uh, perhaps uh, international marketing for a country and a city through cultural brands. Um, and now uh, the background of how uh, I perhaps ended up with Narva is that we always had with our dream uh, in the team of Tallinn Music Week that we wanted to set up a festival in Narva, and we've had very many good partners from on in Russia as well, and especially in St. Petersburg. So Narva was in our radar uh, for a long time already. Uh, so once it was clear that uh, there is this capital of culture round coming up again, so it, it seemed like a natural step. Good. Thanks. How about you? How, what, uh, how did you uh, end up in, uh, in country capital or who's? Well, um, when, um, uh, when it was decided in 2006 that uh, Denmark should host the event in 2017, I was the head of the cultural department of the city of Aarhus. And it was uh, not a very big discussion in Aarhus that we had to go for this title. Copenhagen had it in 96, so we thought it was now our turn. Uh, and it, uh, we provided the, the background material for the city council to decide on, on, the, on bidding. And the 31 out of our 31 city councillors voted for this decision. Um, what they couldn't really agree upon was who should be responsible for the bidding process. Uh, some uh, parties uh, felt that it, it ought to be the tourism organization or the festival organization. Uh, but the majority decided that it should be uh, the cultural department, so it would be the city of Aarhus who is responsible for this uh, bidding process. So the bidding team was built up in the cultural department and worked from 2008 till uh, 2012 or even 13 until we had the foundation who should deliver the, the uh, project. Uh, so um, I was kind of born into to this process after uh, uh, by having this position, uh, which I, I became after having uh, other uh, management positions in cultural institutions in, in uh, Aarhus. Uh, and what we have uh, really been keen on after uh, the foundation uh, really started to work is to keep the close connection between the city and the foundation, which I think we succeeded in, because now the foundation uh, is really not there anymore, so the cities are back. The other thing that we really worked upon was to involve the whole region, which we also succeeded in, so now we have decided to continue this work under the uh, title of European Culture, uh, European Region of Culture. Okay. Uh, we are discussing uh, the, under the title of, um, of European Capital of Culture, uh, for whom and uh, for what? Um, what do you think? What uh, what is European cap uh, capital of culture as a as a title as a format uh, good for? What can you do with it? And maybe also what you can certainly not do. What what is not realistic to hope to do with the European capital of culture? What kind of change is it possible to to realize? Maybe uh, Ip and Suvi, maybe Suvi, you having gone through you uh, through it already. Uh, well, in Turku, based on my experience, um, I still believe and think that as we have lots of experiences also from other cities, European capital of culture can really be a changing fat factor for, for a city. You need to be ambitious and bold to, to, and you need to want to change your city with, with this year and with the process, but that's still possible. Uh, I think that from Turku, 
we had wonderful economic impacts and those were very nice to tell and present to the financiers, uh, decision makers. Then after the year we had 260 million euro worth of uh, economic impact in the region and in the city and 3,300 employment years in the region. Uh, this was Turku School of Economics that made this calculation. But despite of these things that you can count with numbers, uh, you can count numbers, how ma many new tourists came to the city, I still think that the strongest um, thing or the, the biggest uh, thing that culture capital can change is, is more mental. Um, in Turku at least, I would say that the strongest long-term impact is cooperation. Uh, this whole process changed the way uh, completely that uh, people and organizations in Turku uh, were used to and are used to work uh, before this, this process, before this year. Uh, unfortunately, I have to say that there was hardly any cooperation even between the culture sector and the health sector of the city of Turku. And as we kind of demanded and encouraged and, and supported mm -hmm. uh, cooperation to be, be a key element of every project uh, selected to the culture capital program, that became the new reality, that became the new way of doing things. And uh, um, at the moment, it's normal that even so-called competing culture organizations look for partnerships from each other and even go upon the uh, borders of different fields to do things together. And I think that that plus then things like uh, we statistically know that uh, most of the inhabitants of the city of Turku felt more proud of the city after this, this year. They had more uh, positive uh, feeling of their own city. These are the things that really count in the long term. Although the financial and countable uh, results are of course important as well. How do you feel? Like what, what is it good for? What can you do and what can you not achieve with it? Well, a lot of cities uh, use this opportunity to, to uh, kind of improve their cultural uh, infrastructure. But we were so lucky that uh, I think our infrastructure was already decided on or established. So we could, uh, we could really uh, concentrate on, on uh, reaching new levels in terms of um, as you say, cooperation, but especially international cooperation. So I think almost 80% of the projects in 2017 had either international partners or international exchange in some, to some degree. Um, also, I think uh, we used under the theme of let's rethink the possibility to, like you said, with the health sector, to, to kind of involve all sectors in the city to uh, realize what arts and culture can do in different kinds of projects. So all our departments develop their own projects under this theme of, of rethink. But there are a lot of other things like uh, building uh, competences and skills. Some of these, uh, especially the big institutions, thought that don't talk about us developing skills, that's impossible. We are on the highest level. After now they say, we can do things that we never even imagined before we, we started this. So I think it has meant a lot to the cultural institutions and also in terms of audience development. We have seen big increases in uh, practically all cultural institutions over the whole region. Mm -hmm. So that's some of the, the reasons. And of course, all these economic uh, figures, we could come back to them maybe. But maybe now, maybe uh, Tartu and Narva, maybe you can... Uh Give us like a short introduction into uh, around what ideas uh, your proposal, uh, your bits uh, is structured for these cities. Okay, so uh, Tartu's slogan is Arts of Survival. And uh, well, for one, it's a way to rethink uh, the uh, identity of a city itself because uh, up until very recently, the Im image of Tartu was kind of... Um, as our own media wrote about it, uh, Central European Doll City. Quite beautiful, quite well off, but kind of pleased with itself and, and not really aiming much higher. And uh, 
I think people in Estonia are aware that uh, recently there had been this upsurge of public activism in connection with the uh, uh, planned pulp mill near Emayogi. And suddenly people found out that they have this kind of spirit of dissent to, to stand up for their uh, uh, environment. And uh, we kind of seized on that and, uh, and saw that we can go further with this. It's not just that, okay, we managed to keep our backyard clean and, and uh, uh, let's be happy about that and keep it at that. But it's also about what can you do for a region? Does that kind of uh, uh, idea of preserving your ground or, or uh, bringing in the environmental issue into culture, does it also make sense in the whole South Estonian uh, region? And it does. But I think m most crucially, uh, we discovered how much sense it makes in the current global discussions. Mm. And I think above all, we take this as an opportunity to, to ask questions about what does it mean to live in a 21st century city? What's the role of arts in, uh, in uh, reducing or reversing that kind of uh, human harmful impact on the environment? And uh, what's the role of uh, smaller to middle-sized cities like Tartu in, in doing this by changing our, uh, our lifestyle. And, and that's the kind of basic uh, uh, idea behind our, our slogan and our program. Mm -hmm. How about Narva? Um, yes, I mean, your initial question uh, was interesting, the uh, way you were putting it, that what can you do and what can you not do? I think it depends on uh, how wide are the goals. I mean, um, if you look, uh, may maybe I give some background uh, of the situation in Narva. Of course, it's a very unique town, not only in uh, Estonia, but in Europe. There are not very many towns we can name in EU that border directly to Russia. That's one point. Um, I mean, the population in Narva, uh, when Estonia became independent again in 91, was over 80,000 people. Now it's uh, 57,000 people and it's in decline. Um, and unemployment in that area, if Estonia, the average is 5%, then uh, there it's 12.4. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are very many structural challenges in not only in Narva but in the case of the whole eastern part of Estonia. Uh, one thing is also that it's uh, been based on big industries like textile industry and oil shale industry. So I mean if we're looking at uh, part of Estonia from that perspective that it's very sort of um, complicated international uh, sort of diplomacy and foreign affairs situations, uh, we need to discuss things to do with environment and uh, uh, perhaps uh, entrepreneurship in general, um, new ways of finding a new sort of um, driving force for the economy itself. There are very, very many different challenges. Mm -hmm. And especially in a case like that, you really need to question yourself that, okay, what can uh, a process or a title like the capital of culture, you know, what kind of a role can that have? So, I mean, I, there's a lot of this kind of thinking that there are very sort of huge challenges and ambitious plans and if we put the capital of culture title into uh, being a tool in a broader pro uh, process, mm -hmm. then it starts having a different type of a meaning as well. So I think uh, in the case of Narva, there's a lot of uh, looking at the capital of culture title as one of the tools in a much broader process. Mm -hmm. And I mean, collaboration was mentioned in here. I mean, uh, I think Narva could become an ultimate exercise for Estonia in terms of collaboration internationally, but also across all the sectors. I mean, can we really uh, show that um, culture and the creative sector could be a driving force for bringing together, let's say, uh, environmental, entrepreneurial, the tourist sector, uh, education, uh, social affairs. I mean, there, there are very, very many um, issues to tackle that. And of course, our project is aiming to tackle that. So if we kind of set ourselves a target or a sort of a vision for Narva, then um, we want Narva to be a border town with an open, diverse and international cultural life. Mm. Uh, but we also want this to be a life-worthy environment 
for the current inhabitants, but also for the potential future inhabitants and their kids and the youth. So, I mean, the, the, the targets and the goals can be as high as anybody's imagination for a future of a post-industrial town, really. <laughs> Maybe, uh, maybe Ip and, uh, and Suvi, you can say, looking back, um, say from the perspective of, the, um, of a just a person who's living in this city, what is it that, uh, that remains? You, say, you were speaking about the institutions, that the, the spirit of cooperation or you know, the, 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 uh, the mark how high you aim your skills to develop. But uh, this is the institutions, the cultural institutions, your other institutions. But uh, what about the just normal citizen? Uh, what uh, can it change for this normal citizen? Yeah. Well, I will say that uh, a lot of the people in, in Aarhus have something remaining in their memories. And they say for maybe 20 years. And especially some of the really uh, big events like the opening uh, procession with almost 100,000 people in the streets. And, uh, but uh, also other cultural um, um, experiences that they didn't r even think of having uh, before, uh, before this. Because I think uh, the, uh, the project made the people much more curious about uh, uh, watching things and, and uh, maybe also uh, it, it was a little bit easier. But the other thing is that a lot of people uh, also uh, uh, um, were recruited as volunteers, uh, almost 5,000 people, who now um, uh, many of them just uh, continue uh, in, in, uh, in uh, another organizational setting to be uh, like general volunteers, uh, volunteering one day for World Championships in Sailing, which are now in, in, in Aarhus the other uh, day of, uh, for a, a, an open air theater performance and the third day for um, uh, hosting tourism coming in with cruise ships. So I think a lot of people have had personal experiences of being part of these uh, projects as volunteers or as uh, participants. Almost 6,000 uh, volunteers participated in the opening procession. So uh, I, I think that these two things uh, are, are um, the memories of the uh, good experiences they had and their own uh, possibilities to be active. You, uh, if I can ask another question, just um, um, you were mentioning the kind of slogans that that the cities have: that rethink and uh, Narvaez next, right? Or well, it's more of a hashtag, but yes. But what, what's the slogan? Uh, we, we haven't, uh, we've started from another end. I think uh, the slogan is a final outcome f through a more um, sort of a diverse yeah. uh, process. But Narva is next, is something, what, 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 why we love this is that uh, where this is coming from is, um, you know, all of us have probably uh, witnessed these articles in international media um, following the news, uh, especially right um, after the Crimea happened, that asking the question, is Narva next? Mm. So uh, there's a lot of sort of fear-related coverage towards uh, that particular city. So we thought that uh, let's turn this around. Let's make it a statement that Narva is next, but in an entirely different way. Mm. Uh, it's sort of... Um, confidence building and uh, faith in, uh, you know, Narva being able to be something totally else. So for now it is Nar Narva, isn't it? Yes. Uh, uh, but uh, say in Turku, it's uh, Turku on fire or somehow in, in Turku, uh, uh, as in Finnish, Turku pala, meaning also Turku is coming up again and so on. In, uh, for Tartu, arts of survival, so all, all the cities and also other cities have this kind of hashtag or, or, or punchline. Uh, and you were talking about the programs, so maybe we can talk about the uh, how you see the balance between uh, the program. Well, basically, well, I can say from my uh, experience, I used to work in Italian 2011 culture capital, running uh, or managing uh, interdisciplinary projects. And when I joined this uh, foundation, I used to think that uh, culture capital is a culture program with a, you know, communication slight edge. And then uh, at the end I thought it's more like a, of, a, of a communication program with a culture edge. 
So clearly it's a question of balance. How do you see? Is it more a communication thing or a program thing? And also probably it also relates to budgets, finally, at the end. Maybe Suvi. Yeah, well, I think both are definitely important. In Turku, uh, culture and arts came first. That was clear. The content was in the core and that was first, but we needed good co communication, good marketing to fulfill all the objectives that we had. And if we had a wonderful program, wonderful culture content, then what would it have been if we wouldn't have communicated it properly, both locally, nationally and internationally? Uh, Money-wise, 65% of our 55 million euro budget was still used for the programming, for the content, and only 16% only for the communication and marketing, which I think is still a healthy budget for, for marketing. Uh, but as um, culture capital is, is a lot about profile changes in the cities, it's a lot about uh, um, alluring people, inhabitants of the city and tourists to see the city from a new perspective and, and to also learn to enjoy new arts, art forms and new cultural forms that they never dare to touch or come close to before. Communication is essential and we had a, I, I would say that our, in Turku, our strategy for communication and marketing was, was quite successful. It was a little bit humoristic and it made, uh, we had all over city uh, posters where, where there were funny comments about culture and arts, um, even sometimes ironical. And that made that people felt that, okay, this is not something really scary, this culture capital. Uh, maybe I dare to also go and, and, and attend an event. And when they attended one event, maybe an open door free event, and thought that, oh, wow, this is, this is really wonderful. Then next time they, they dared to buy a ticket to a modern dance performance and enjoyed that as well. And I think that our statistics um, research then afterwards said that um, a lot of people uh, really experienced the culture, culture offering um, which they have never, or art forms that they have never uh, experienced before and they liked it and they want to experience that again. So I definitely say that there is not one without the other. But how about, how do you see in Tartu, it's, is it more about uh, changing the, uh, the city's profile or more about uh, changing what kind of culture takes place in Tartu? Well, they are, uh, they are uh, so tightly interlinked that you, you can't dif differentiate it there. The whole process of uh, putting together the bid of Tartu has been largely, if not mostly, about communication. So by now we have had uh, uh, close to 350 meetings with different interest groups, different experts, different uh, people uh, from a city to find out uh, for as wide range as possible, how do people imagine Tartu? What do they uh, dream of? What they are not secret, secretly satisfied with? And, uh, and so this kind of idea of a whole concept of, of arts of survival has grown out uh, from a very broad public base of uh, different but overlapping interests. Mm. And, and this process is bound to continue as we extend it to, well, we have already extended it to the whole South Estonian region who is going to cooperate uh, with us. And we're going to extend it to uh, our international partners because after all, one of the major outcomes we expect from this process is to have a much broader international range of cultural operators in the city. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's still largely organized by the locals. It's, it's a big thing if you're, uh, if a landlord in uh, the corner pub is an Italian, or if you have a sound manager in the club who's American, it shouldn't be such, a, such an exception. We need much more international uh, uh, active base of cultural organizers. Try, try getting um, funding from Kultur Capital if you're Dutch, for example. Yes, but it's the same with cultural, uh, uh, cultural project uh, funding. You have to have the Estonian ID card, you have to speak Estonian to uh, even apply for funding. But, uh, I mean, that is largely about communication. Finding out what people uh, 
see as the, the shortcomings of the current situation and then enlarging from that into possible solutions. And what we're trying to do now is to create environments for certain program lines and create the communication base for including as many operators as possible. But the program itself is largely already made by those people. Mm. It's, it's very significant that, that we use words like festival or, or exhibition or program only by default. What we really expect to happen is that uh, new people from different countries, new people from new generations, mm. new people from uh, quarters uh, so far not so much connected with culture, come in and start to organize events, start to create venues we can't even think of right now. But what about Narva? Is it? Is it? Uh, I mean, there is, you you laid out uh, how uh, how problematic it is. Is it then more about the city profile for Narva, uh, the communication part, or more the program part? Um, well, of course, the key element I think in everything is sort of uh, uplifting or building the confidence of the citizens, and uh, it's also about perception. How do the locals themselves perceive uh, their city and the whole region, and how does everybody else perceive this city? And I think, uh, especially in the case of Narva, there has to be a lot of, you know, kind of an upgrade in this level of faith, what can we do? Um, and that is always about communication and perhaps uh, we can say storytelling. There's a lot of this kind of like finding these angles of storytelling. That there is, I mean, there's layer, Narva, somebody said, I think Maris from our team said this beautiful story that, uh, you know, when you look at Narva, it's a bit like um, uh, ma many of us, I can see, were yesterday at the premiere of the Kremli Öbikud in Narva in the old uh, 19th century, uh, century factory called Grenholm, which is huge, 300,000 uh, square meters of an industrial space right next to Russia. And uh, you go into these rooms and there are these layers of paint kind of peeling off from each other. So in Narva, in the case of Narva, you know, the closer you look, the more layers you see. It's like this, everybody, but I mean, the cultural richness, I mean, something I didn't mention, which is crucial to know about Narva is it's... Um, 94% Russian spoken. Uh, so Estonian language in the case of Narva is a minority language actually, which is mm -hmm. quite interesting. Uh, so there is a lot of this storytelling and confidence building that needs to happen. Uh, and sometimes the locals also perceive their own town via international communication, for example. You know, sometimes it kind of helps you quite a lot if, you know, Helsinki Sanomat says that this is the, you know, next hipster capital of Europe, you know. You're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> but then you're actually like, but why not? You know. So it's a lot of this perception shift that needs to happen. But this is equally to do with uh, confidence in local programming, but also confidence that if I'm going to put this ambitious programming out there, are there going to be people who are going to be interested in that? Mm -hmm. I mean, we can see um, uh, increase in interest. Uh, the trends are kind of ch uh, changing already in the case of Narva. This summer has been full of cultural events by itself. Uh, the fact that right now there is a theatre production actually done by Tartu, which is beautiful, that there is this Tartu-Narva collaboration. Tartu U's Theatre is doing uh, their biggest ever uh, theatre production based in Narva in the Grenholm factory. And by now it sold 18,000 tickets. And we're all like, okay, how can we study this? You know, we need to research who are these people coming? Are they local, uh, regional, all over Estonia, international? This is very interesting. But let's listen to Kurasara. Yes. Because we also have Kurasara here. So, uh, so how do you plan to, uh, to organize and then center the ro uh, around what idea do you plan to organize the culture capital in Kurasara? Thank you. Um, can you hear me here? Yes. Uh, so thank you uh, very much for giving uh, me the floor as well. Yes, it's uh, uh, only me from our Kurasara team, but here is also Mela, who is also uh, working uh, very closely with us. Yes, you might think that Kurasara is a very small city and very far away, but uh, this um, Bidding process uh, is uh, very useful for us and uh, our story or our narrative will be 
that Sarama is Ultima Thule, the place beyond the known world. So this is something with which we would like to stress that uh, as we know from the history, the islanders, inhabitants of Saarema, have always been a little bit different from the people from mainland. We have this kind of revolutionary minds and uh, we have our own views to things. And so we like to do things differently. And so um, uh, we thought that why not? Why, why not to see this as a window of opportunities? And as you might know, in uh, Saarama we had uh, the big local government reform. And at the moment we can really feel, and uh, if you uh, talk with local people, that we are all looking for the new opportunities. We see that we can do something together. So this is something that uh, we really should use at the moment. And of course, uh, now when we are preparing our proposal for uh, Capital of Culture, we are rethinking our uh, cultural area. We are rethinking of the old um, strategy, how, uh, to, uh, how to elaborate uh, the work and life in Saarema. And uh, so this is something important. And also we think that this process is really much about cooperation, as it was mentioned before. And we also have had quite many discussions with uh, different uh, people in Saarema, in different areas. And, um, well, we have gathered quite a lot of ideas. And, of course, something which I would also like to mention is that we are really rethinking what means Europe for us. And I think this is also <coughs> something very important, that we are a member of European Union, we are a member of Europe, but what it really means. And uh, what we do at the moment, we rethink about these values which are behind that. And I think this is something really nice what we are doing at the moment. That Europe is about cooperation, it's about inclusion, and so uh, these values are also very important. And as was mentioned by representative of Turku, we also um, stress the importance of including everyone in this process already that also people who have not maybe equal access to uh, cultural events and so on, that they uh, also these people who think that this is not for me. So we think it's also very important to include them as well, to show them that culture is not only maybe about opera or very fancy art performances, but this is something that we all, all can enjoy. This Great. is also important. Great, thanks. I would like to ask, you, you said that you were doing quite strong cooperation with the region. Uh, uh, now, uh, remembering it uh, freshly, the cooperation, how it worked, maybe you can elaborate how to do it. Because clearly this is also an issue both for, uh, uh, for Sarama that is now like, okay, now you are one uh, municipality, you know, it's it's one one thing, but still, like uh, how to cooperate, how to cooperate with uh, Southern Estonian different municipalities. Is there some hints you would like to propose to to colleagues who are going to face it? Um, it was uh, very easy for the city council in Aarhus to decide to bid, but it was not as easy as that to uh, invite the region. Um, uh, to decide to invite the region. The region uh, has 1.3 million in, uh, inhabitants like Estonia uh, and um, it, uh, it runs from the west coast of Jutland to the east coast and there are in fact big cultural uh, differences and also n no tradition for cooperation whatsoever. Yeah. So uh, uh, the political stability we have had in Aarhus was not uh, at all the case in other parts of the region. From the very beginning they thought that we just were after their money and uh, having everything happen in, in Aarhus and just getting them t uh, having them to pay for it. Uh, so, uh, but but uh, in fact, we were very much urged by the uh, by the international panel in Brussels to to try to do this because uh, there are very good experiences of involving the region. So we uh, decided to to invite. Uh, I think the city council decided uh, a year after uh, deciding to bid uh, to invite the whole region. Um, and uh, one hint I could give is. Uh, uh, 
it, it can take some time. So, uh, so decide very early if you are going to do this or not. Uh, we ha had to, uh, because the region in, in, uh, in, in our case was not that popular in the municipalities. So we had to do maybe most of the work from the city of Aarhus ourselves to convince these cities to, uh, to, to go into it. Uh, and I think uh, they were very skeptical from the beginning and uh, now they are all very happy and uh, they have seen that they were, uh, they were part of something bigger that also in their cases they had a lot of things happening, a lot of uh, citizens involved and a lot of uh, new audiences uh, coming into the uh, institutions. So it's also decided to try to uh, to continue uh, in the in, in the years to come to uh, to make some things together between these 19 municipalities of very different uh, size. Uh, so uh, I think the uh, experiences turned out to to be good, but we had to uh, we had to uh, invent um, a tool to convince them called return on investment. So they uh, they uh, had uh, they demanded a contract saying that for every one Danish krona we put into this foundation, at least the value of one Danish krona come back to our citizens. Uh, so we had to uh, you know calculate and calculate, and uh, eventually everyone got from like 100% uh, back to 800% back. So uh, I think. Most of them are, are very happy also in economic terms, but it, it kind of uh, changed the, the focus from these cities on the, do we get enough back instead of focusing on uh, what's happening in our, uh, for our citizens and, and what's uh, going on in terms of culture. They were too much focused on economy, I think, so you should take care to, to use this tool. I wouldn't really recommend it, but it was necessary in our case. Uh, you mentioned already politics. This is also a question that needs to be discussed uh, with Culture Capital. Uh, I remember when we talked, you said that uh, also the board changed uh, several times, the artistic board also. Uh, but, but okay, let's say with politics, uh, how, um, how to manage uh, in this uh, whirlwind that can be politics? I mean, be, having been in Tallinn Culture Capital, you know, <laughs> Uh, we had some quite interesting things with various parties and uh, must say that uh, uh, one of the parties is uh, quite strong in Tartu and one of the parties quite strong in Narva actually. And I also remember the day when, when uh, the uh, internal security uh, secret police came in to uh, ask some questions, uh, not from me, but you know, from, uh, let's say, people higher up. So. Um, this might uh, well actually this is in the news uh, in in Narva right now so and actually also the same institution has uh, arrested some people some uh, uh, vice mayors in Tartu as well they do so, get around don't they yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, so how do you how to survive politics with culture capital maybe Suvi you can give a hint well, I think that considering many stories that I have heard from all around Europe we were very lucky in this sense um, we had f from the beginning a unanimous uh, support uh, by the city council so the city council made in 2004 a unanimous de decision that Turku should apply to become to European capital of culture and that was very very strong very important that everybody despite of their political viewpoints thought that this is important for the city and that continued until the the very end so nobody even though there were elections during the years nobody took European capital of culture issue as a kind of a tool for their political agendas but this was always something that everybody supported and I think that that's that's important but at the same time I recognize that um, it is important to establish um, governance um, uh, uh, governance for the foundation or whatever the structure is of, of running the, in practice, the culture capital, where uh, the decisions will be made not based on the political interests, but uh, undependent on that. So, so based on the culture values, based on the objectives set for the culture capital process. Uh, we had a board which was okay. They, we had the mayor, we had other representatives of the different uh, political parties of, of, of 
of the city council in the board, but we also had actually majority representing, representing the art fields, the ministries, the, the uh, culture institutions, universities, uh, and the chairman was, was very um, uh, independent in a way that um, he always fought uh, for the best interests of the matter itself, meaning Turku 2011, the objectives of Turku 2011. And that gave us, the people who were working for, for these aims and for the project, a very, very important backbone and support. And, and so we were maybe the, the lucky ones, I think. Perk and Helen, how do you feel like uh, looking ahead? Uh, do, you, do you feel shaky? Do you feel sure? Well, you, you mean in terms of local politics? In terms of local and mm -hmm. maybe also state politics, because it's a, it's a combination. Well, as for local politics, uh, uh, every political party lining up against the pulp mill helped a lot. Mm. So, so arts of survival raised no questions. Everyone supported it. But, but I mean, that's the easy bit. That's the easy bit to, to get get this uh, decision from everyone to support the, the starting of a process. What comes next is uh, a lot of investments, which uh, have to start now. I mean, once you've decided, you get in. Uh, on the bidding process, uh, you you have to start making more investments in culture and related uh, uh, areas than before, and and there uh, comes in the, the the difficult bit, the negotiations, the actual explaining why we need this already now and why certain things have to be rethought uh, in terms of uh, budget policy. Uh, in terms of uh, national politics. Uh, Currently, I guess no one really knows what happens uh, after the elections in, in uh, March next year. Mm. We can only hope for the best that they, they can stay uh, <laughs> in this side of Europe how, we are living in now. Helen, how, what is your strategy for surviving uh, politicians? <laughs> Well, as it always has been, just being myself. <laughs> but uh, on a more serious note, I think um, there again, Narva's situation is quite unique in a way that it has been neglected the national spotlight for a long time. So I think uh, I have this feeling that uh, absolutely all the political parties in one way or the other feel that uh, you know there needs to be some sort of focus. Of course, if, if we say focus, then capital of culture is just only one of the things. Mm. And of course, there has been more and more and more uh, national initiative towards uh, Narva in general. I mean, uh, the Ministry of Culture is doing a lot uh, um, there are things happening and it's, it's ba been in a positive increase, but um, I don't know, there is no formula and as we say that there's no way of knowing where the politics turn, but I think one thing that we can do is to really build a strong concept that is very much rooted in what this uh, community, the citizens and the town, what this city needs in general. Um, not not in a way that sort of like in competition to Tartu or to Kurasara, but in very honest uh, terms that this city needs those things in general, be it capital of culture or not. Mm. So it's one thing is just looking at it, what happens if Narva doesn't win or what happens if Tartu doesn't win. So I think everything we do is rooted uh, in the type of thinking that Narva deserves this whatever happens. Mm. <laughs> what happened in Tartu when Tartu didn't win in two th for 2011? I guess we, we uh, benefited hugely from the bidding process itself mm. because uh, uh, I think this bidding process really took Tartu the cultural life of Tartu in the 21st century. Mm. It became a lot more international already then by, by uh, the standards of, uh, of early uh, 2000s, of course. Uh, it, uh, it brought uh, on a lot of uh, new organizers. It brought on this kind of uh, uh, foolhardy optimism that you can do things uh, culturally, you can change things, you can start uh, public initiatives. At the time, the, uh, the local financing was pretty uh, beneficial towards new initiatives. And uh, 
I think a lot of this persisted. Now we take this as a normality. Now we take this uh, as a kind of uh, uh, standstill even. But at the time it was a huge change. Hmm. Uh, maybe it's uh, now slowly time to ask questions from the audience. Usually uh, people spring up right away in Estonia asking questions. Uh, <laughs> so you have to kick them away. But not today for some reason. So... Um, Okay, this is just for the warm-up, so you can start thinking. Well, we still have half an hour, more or less. Um, and I'll ask a question maybe that is um, part of the, uh, the, the other important part of the, of the title of this uh, discussion, and namely the uh, for whom. You know, uh, 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 how do you uh, engage local... Uh, uh, Local, local people, uh, meaning local actors, but also uh, meaning local, uh, local, just local citizens, and uh, also the question when, mm -hmm. when do you engage them? Uh, uh, so maybe, maybe if you have some suggestions uh, or some just uh, recollections on how you did it. Well, I think uh, it's very important to have a, a, a very broad uh, participation from from uh, citizens, uh, uh, um, from cultural institutions, so on, uh, uh, during the bidding process. Mm. So we had uh, quite a lot of project development as part of the bidding process, so that when uh, we got the title, of course, any uh, art artistic or program manager had to be kind of loyal to this uh, bidding, uh, uh, to this bid, because uh, that was the reason we got the title, we think. Uh, so, and, and we had a, a quite a huge in, involvement. Our project manager for the bidding process, Trevor Davies, is used to do things like that. Uh, and he involves, uh, I, I said, you're crazy, you're involving all these people, but he, in some way he, he managed to, to make the book. <laughs> Mm. And um, I think uh, one of our challenges was that uh, some of the cultural environments or, or some groups in the populations are, are very, it, it's, uh, it's uh, impossible to involve them so long time before an event is going on. Mm. Like a uh, uh, youth environment, uh, they are not young anymore when a, <laughs> when a time comes uh, or in fact, for, for instance, the rock uh, music uh, environment, they have kind of a planning horizon of six months or, or something like that now. So six years, is, uh, it's, it, it's, it's difficult. So you have to kind of cope with how to involve everyone because n not everyone has uh, this mindset or this planning horizon uh, from going years ahead. So I think that's one of the challenges. But, so I, but I still think it's important to involve as many as possible from the very start. Mm -hmm. But it's not impossible for everyone. I totally agree. I think that's very, very important and crucial for the long-term impacts of the European capital of culture in a local, local level. We also had in Turku a very wide participative process uh, for the bid. Uh, we had thousands of people involved, not only from the culture sector, but uh, the main point was to ask everybody. Um, culture, artists, uh, universities, entrepreneurs, children, what do you want from, from your city? What should culture capital and what could it bring to you? What should it not be? That was also a very, very uh, popular question and easy, easy to answer for many. Um, and I think that that was also one of the reasons that if Turku would not have been selected as the European Capital of Culture, still this process of, of doing things and planning, visioning your city together uh, in, in wide groups would have already brought a lot of good for, for the future of the city. And I come back to this, this uh, issue of cooperation and, and new networks, which then at the end was one of the big results for the culture capital. Already then many people said after workshops where a student, artist, uh, a big uh, company leader, university professor were sitting in a workshop one day together planning, planning what culture capital should be. They said that, wow, this is really interesting to discuss with you. Can we do cooperation 
anyway with something else as well. And this is, is why participation and, and uh, in, including everybody with this is important. We also did one thing that many culture capitals have been um, having disappointments with, namely open calls. So when we, mm. we did the program, the program was consisting mainly of course, we had also some some uh, invited uh, projects and, and curated projects by ourselves, but most of the program was based on an open call. What's bad about it? Uh, in many culture capitals, there has been a lot of disappointment uh, in the results of open calls. So Turku, and I think maybe Tallinn was quite happy with the results as well, but uh, Turku definitely was very happy with that because we thought that this is the only way to do thing, uh, construct a, a program in a democracy like Finland, at, at least we, we felt that the openness of this process, everybody's equal on the same level and, and the criteria are clear and open. That was the way to, to make it also everybody's project. Uh, if you had the same op opportunity to uh, apply for the funding, apply to the program as anybody else, there was no complain complaints that, uh, well, why did you invite him but not me? Mm. Uh, and, and therefore, I think this was, uh, for us at least, we felt that this was a very, very good... Uh, of course, we had negotiations then. And, and um, one thing which is uh, um, I want to add is also how to keep the balance between the local artists and the local field and the ones who come from other institutions in the country and elsewhere in the world, the artists who, who come from other parts of Europe. Um, I think one of the important things of Capitals of Culture is, is to uh, be able to open the, the culture field also for national artists and institutions and international artists and institutions. But we at least had a condition, anybody could apply from anywhere from the world to, to get the funding and to be part of the European Capital of Culture. But there was a condition, you always needed then uh, eventually to find a partner from Turku. Uh, uh, so that was the way to ensure that there was not not one single project where just the external group would come in and then leave after the Culture Capital year. and. It would just say as a nice memory we once experienced, but always there would be some capacity building or experiences left also in the local uh, artistic but culture field. But let me ask field. Helen, you, uh, I read that you said at the, at the launch of the, of the bidding in, in Narva that uh, in a way Narva is a, like uh, Russian-speaking Europe. I mean, it's not in, even in a way it is Russian-speaking Europe. Yes. So, and you said in this context that there should be better cultural ties with Russia. Uh, can you elaborate on this and, and uh, what you think is possible to do? Yeah, there are several things to... I just wanted to comment as well that it's a great idea, like Turku did that, if you bring in international or, or national productions to kind of tie this in with uh, local uh, managements and artists and, uh, and the community. I mean, we're doing this, for example, right now, we're, we're set up a festival in Narva called Station Narva, and uh, we have an equal, even a bigger team there on spot in Narva than we have our own team in Tallinn. And, and we see already that, of course, it makes the process, um, in a way, there are more challenges in the process. It's always easy to jump in your team and, you know, do like you always do. But that's not the point. So, but we, we see already that that's the only way to go there. In the case of Narva, I mean, it's interesting as well to look at the background because it's a city that comes from the industrial past. People are used to, you know, being employed by somebody. So there is not uh, a lot of this initiative taking um, historically. Even there is this um, Narva initiated discussion uh, brand called Bazaar. They're initiating a lot of discussions. The next one is actually titled, Why is Narva passive? So there is a lot of these uh, challenges in how do we include the citizens 
But what is really important, uh, interesting to see right now, how motivated the youth are, mm. um, and and especially. But, but, but there's not much of youth in Narva. Well, there there still are, <laughs> and they're very motivated because you know they don't have it. You know, it was quite beautiful actually. Um, an Estonian uh, politician, Jana Dom, in fact, mm. said this uh, sentence that I will never forget. You know, saying her advice to us is that you know go to the schools, take these kids, don't go to the school directors and you know these kind of education leaders, go direct to the kids, take them by the hand and take them to the woods and the fields and you know talk to them and kind of inspire them out of their usual box of thinking you know the way that things have always been done in there mm -hmm. so it's kind of and then we've d done these um, studies uh, and questionnaires during uh, uh, this process uh, with the local community and it's quite interesting to see the type of answers that the youth give for example a particular answer that strikes out from the youth is in the uh, in them saying that what they think Narva needs they say Narva needs more color Mm. I mean, street art is, inc and Ivan can uh, know more about this, uh, being a head architect of the city. Mm. Uh, but it's a growing trend that there's a lot of street art suddenly in Narva, you know. And, and kids and youths are noticing this, that, uh, you know, Narva is a town that you normally describe in grey, different shades of grey, basically. <laughs> but uh, this colour element uh, is a great motif metaphor in all sorts of diversity. And you, you see that the youth, you're for that so you know we, we do have a special focus in uh, going directly to the youth uh, but you mentioned uh, including the Russian partners yes uh, St. Petersburg from Narva is 150 kilometers away which is closer than Tallinn is from Narva and it's six million people and um, in our experience within the Festival of Italian Music Week, we do have a lot of amazing progressive independent thinking partners in Europe, uh, in Russia, I mean. And all they want to do is actually be in normal collaborative relationships with uh, organizations in Europe. Mm. So our thinking has always been that we need to encourage more of that this kind of uh, collaborations with an independent thinkers in Russia, the creative sector, the entrepreneurial sector. And we kind of have this dream that imagine if Narva would become this kind of a positive collaboration hub between EU and Russia, wouldn't that be amazing? So that makes the Narva project not an Estonian project, but very, very clearly an European project as the capital of culture is and should be in any way. So, so I mean, the ties, um, in Narva to the Russian creative community are evident, but I mean, all of us in Estonia have great partners in Finland as well. I mean, we should, I think, build on this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Also, Tartu is quite close to the Russian border. It is, and and I think uh, this Russian aspect comes in uh, one way or another with with any candidate city because. Mm. Uh, after all, we have uh, a strong Russian cultural tradition, for example, with semiotics, we have still uh, quite an active Russian community. We have mm. a literary festival with contacts with Russian authors, uh, UNESCO City of Literature, all that kind of cooper cooperation already going on. If we include the region as we're going to do, we have a whole Lake Papers area, uh, the Orthodox community, but also if we we emphasize that kind of environmental mm. uh, issue in terms of our bid, that means cooperation with Russian environmentalists mm. over the Lake Papers. And uh, I mean, there are a, a whole lot of aspects that come in in terms of the various ways how we, we need to be that kind of interface between Russia and Europe. Mm. What does it mean? What kind of cultural context does it mean? What kind of subjects does it mean in terms of highlighting uh, in uh, in this kind of uh, uh, mutual way in a way? Mm. We can translate some of the Russian issues for Europe at the same time we can propagate some European ideas uh, for Russia. I was just thinking of Pirisar, it's right at the border with Russia. You know. It is, I mean, there, there's a lot of... of Tartulin, yeah. So, yeah. It is a lot of... Uh, it, it has a lot of possibilities for not just mm. artistic, but, but in a larger way, uh, cultural interactions. As a matter of fact, Estonia is on the border with Russia. <laughs> yeah, of course. 
Surprise, surprise. Yeah. So it's not just Narva versus mm -hmm. Tartu or whatever, it's actually an entire region. Mm -hmm. We're talking of course. about the Baltic states, we're talking Finland, we're talking about the whole eastern border with runs of 3,000 kilometers. Great, can you, can you add a question as well? No, just a statement. Mm. Okay. No, it's it's actually great great to have a comment by you know if uh, um, we talk about the Narva team, then uh, Ivan is actually living in Narva, has been li living there, uh, studied in America meanwhile, but now is the head architect of Narva City. So it would be great to if you can throw in another this comment. A, <laughs> this is actually a great thing with uh, interesting thing with Narva that uh, that because of the. Uh, the somehow brain drain, let's say, you know, lots of young people used to leave Narva, leave Narva and still do, to, to not to leave to Tallinn, but leave, leave to other, other universities or wherever. So uh, do you plan to somehow engage, speaking about engagement, mm. do you plan to engage this kind of diaspora, some, uh, the Narva diaspora in UK or something? Okay, it's a. Uh, <laughs> we, we, definitely, we definitely plan to you, uh, engage the heart to the diaspora. Why not Narva, the diaspora as well, because uh, Narva, after all, Narva College is part of Tartu University. But, oh, yeah, uh, right, yeah. but I mean, it's, it's a major uh, thing in terms of our bed that uh, we have uh, also a kind of brain drain. People going away to, to study elsewhere, to work elsewhere how to regain those contacts, how to lure them back in a way. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we have uh, now already 1,000 plus uh, uh, foreign students every year. They should be, at least some of them, should be major players in the cultural scene. Mm. So how to achieve that? Mm. Why only pub runs? How, how, how can we include them in actual cultural management? Uh, and how can we make them stay as citizens? I think a lot of talk about cultural as capital. Citizens. As citizens. Uh, a lot of talk about cultural capital is how to increase tourism. Mm. What we are much more concerned with is uh, how to get more permanent citizens mm. from all parts of the world. Helen wants to say something. Uh, no, I was just uh, wanting to think about this brain drain uh, situation. And it's quite interesting to witness these cases, especially in the case of Narva, where you see um, Ivan is a great example. Um, went to study uh, in America, worked there, came back. I mean, the head uh, artist, uh, Denis, is another example who's now working for the Narva City, was actually working for the Liverpool capital of culture when Liverpool was the capital of culture and now went back to Narva. I mean, and the advantages of having these kind of fluent in three languages type of people, Estonian, Russian, English, in there, there are several and we see more and more and more of those. It kind of uh, also tells a story. What are these type of people who go and go back and they kind of take it as their life mission to go and sort of give back to their hometown. And I've been uh, giving this uh, comparison. It's uh, maybe just a personal idea how this looks like, but it's, I, I can see this sort of an East Berlin f effect that mm. the type of people who want to go back there just want to do big and brave things in a very challenging situation. Mm. So it's, there's nothing to do with going back into a comfortable situation with a lot of coffee shops and uh, you know nice things to have around you. It's a, a situation where you go back to go and you know let's do this we want to change something you know we want to transform something and I think transformation is is the key uh, word that rings in our minds if we think about the Narva project <laughs> now I mean this is now slowly getting really heated up we still have 15 <laughs> minutes so it's really uh, time for somebody to ask a question no just one please no okay or I'd like to come back to the issue of youth because I think that's really important. I mean, when we started to, to draw our new cultural strategy in Tartu, then at one moment uh, I looked around the table and uh, discovered, well, those are the same people as 10 years ago. Isn't it horrible? I mean, we're all the young ones. Yeah. <laughs> and, and when you start to understand that, that you have to address the new uh, organizers or the now when they are at school because in six years 
they might have graduated university already. Mm -hmm. And then they have this choice whether they have uh, a tight connection with tight to certain ambitions here, or, or whether they, they choose to leave for, for somewhere more interesting. And, and again, that's uh, a point where you, you think about what kind of a new challenge you can give to them. Right now, a lot of young people think, think that Tartu is nice and safe and it's, it's nice to live here, but, but not very exciting. So, how to take the city to the next level that could uh, provide them with a new kind of excitement? Mm. And how to involve uh, them in creating that kind of excitement very early on? Uh, you said before that uh, it's uh, really important to get all the, uh, the institutions uh, uh, on board, basically, as early as possible. Uh, is there other things, or also Suvi, uh, that uh, you absolutely uh, need to do in the bidding phase that you cannot do later on? That you know has to be done then, or that has to definitely not be done in this phase. You know, not to fuck it up. Yeah, well, for example, um, all infrastructural uh, questions should be already considered then already because of the time running. Um, and, um, of course, when, when uh, the selection is made, it's, it's uh, partly a question of uh, which city, city has the uh, big vision of, of, of the city, what, uh, what it make, wants, to, wants the city to become uh, after the or through the European Capital of Culture process, um, but it's also a question of of um, um, having enough capacity and credibility to actually provide those visions, and therefore uh, before the bid, you need to have either already existing enough or a very, very um, credible plan how to have all these supporting not only culture um, infrastructure and, and uh, capacity, you can of course develop it during the process and you should, uh, but also hotel accommodations, restaurants, uh, what is your plan how to, to uh, make the city as accessible as possible for the tourists coming from Europe. And don't forget the European dimension. Uh, still already now we have tens of European capitals of culture that have existed. We have probably hundreds which have bid it to become the European capital of culture. What is the way that your city is going to convince the, especially the European juries that, that uh, we have something that interests Europe. We can provide a question and, and something that really is interesting for, for everybody, not only for our city, although of course the local, local uh, long-term perspective, uh, perspective is also important. Um, I totally agree with, with Suvi, uh, but uh, to this question about the European dimension, I would maybe add that this was one of our big challenges. And I think for many cities, it's a big challenge that the international panel uh, in Brussels, uh, making really making the decision, they uh, urge us uh, all the time to uh, strengthen the European dimension or the international dimension. And that's not something you do like this. It takes time, uh, of course, to develop international relations. So I, I think this is really something that should be taken into uh, uh, really serious account uh, during the bidding process. As early as possible. As early as possible. Mm. Sorry, I, uh, a question, please, please. Okay, yes. I just, uh, to me, it's a very interesting project. Right now, we're in this phase that uh, by October the 1st, we need to submit the preliminary uh, application, right? Uh, so uh, these expectations are so super high in this phase already. And I mean, we, there is this also a bit of, I don't know, maybe you can uh, have your own uh, experience about this sort of managing the expectations because inclusion of people is a process that you can do however much you want and still there are going to be people who feel they're left out always so it's kind of a fact you need to live with and especially at that early of the phase that you don't end up in a panic situation 
when somebody met another person who hasn't uh, heard that Narva is becoming the capital of culture. You know, it's a bit like being realistic about it as well yourself that you know there, there are things you can't do as early in the phase. You know, the, I mean, if the result by 2024 is going to know that everybody knows. That's also quite optimistic, but, but I don't know how your experience out of it has been. Uh, just wanted to say this comment as well. We were talking about this regional inclusion. Mm. Um, it was interesting to hear the Aarhus uh, experience. In our case, it was completely vice versa. When the news was out that Narva is applying, you know, uh, friends from Rakvere and all over Viruma were pouring in saying that we want to be part of this project. Mm. And, uh, you know, right now it's not only the eastern part of uh, Estonia, Ida Viruma, now it's the whole Viruma project. Mm. Uh, but of course, one thing is just wanting to be included. Now we need to make this very realistic uh, actual collaborations with everybody. <laughs> what was your experience in, in southern Estonia? Were the, uh, were the other municipalities jumping mm -hmm. in on you, saying that we want to be part of this, or the other way around, that you approach them? It came very naturally because already uh, when bidding for uh, 2011, we had uh, southern Estonia on the board. And uh, uh, I think uh, a lot of them expected uh, us to, to include them again. And uh, I mean, Tartu has been advertising itself as a kind of capital of southern Estonia, but now especially uh, we have to figure out what it actually means. I mean, there's a whole uh, lot of responsibility to, to be taken. If you, if you look at the mm -hmm. processes in southern Estonia right now where uh, smaller hospitals are being closed down and everything centralized in Tartu, then we are really expected to give something back. Hmm. And the, the other thing is that uh, after that kind of uh, public management reform, there's a, a lot of confusion. I mean, people or, or, or smaller muni municipalities are uncertain about their identities. They don't even know uh, what their official foreign partners are right now. Hmm. Because borders have been redrawn and they are kind of looking for, for certain kind of assistance in redefining their identities, mm. belonging into some kind of uh, a bigger alliance that would uh, promote them abroad. Mm. Uh, question? No? Okay, then I would like to ask about the infrastructure thing you, you brought up. Uh, uh, cultural infrastructure, okay, but, uh, but there's also re real infrastructure like... Uh, Accessibility. I mean, this was also the case in Tallinn. Uh, the question of direct flights uh, to Tallinn is quite problematic, but uh, uh, but somehow it, uh, this is even more uh, of an issue in in Tartu and and all, actually in all of these cities. Uh, is this an issue uh, that you feel you? Is there something that can be done or that you did to somehow enhance this? To talk to like the uh, flight companies or train companies or, or, or it, I mean, there's uh, technically there's all, even an airport in Narva. Uh, so and there, <laughs> and there is uh, there is certainly an airport in Dartu, but not much flights going on. So, uh, so how, what can be done? What can be expected to be done in this? And, and how did the title change it? Did you get uh, uh, better connectivity already by acquiring the title? Uh, uh, we did not. It's, uh, it's the standing discussion, and of course it was tried, uh, but, but we have done this for the last 40 years, uh, and uh, this really didn't move uh, so much. But it is uh, as it is, and people are able to come if they want to. And um, I think uh, the one uh, which is not really accessibility, but the one thing uh, which really, where 2017 really meant something, was the huge increase in cruise ship. Uh, cruise ships coming in, uh, yeah. arising from like 10 a year to uh, more than 40. Okay. So we, you well, we had a pretty good situation to start with. Uh, the starting point was, was rather good. We have um, every day several ferries between Stockholm and Turku, and uh, we have an air airport uh, and, and used to have still then planes uh, regularly from, Stock, uh, from Stockholm and Copenhagen nowadays, from Stockholm and Helsinki, and then some from, from other destinations like Riga. Um, and then, of course, two hours train from Helsinki. So, I mean, we had pretty good, but sure, during the 
process itself and then later on especially we we did negotiations to get for example later train uh, routes uh, tours uh, back to Helsinki for example after mm. evening program things like this this is natural part of the development I want to make a comment uh, I, I short wait, one please yes um, for example we need to think about the mobility issue in a in the context of innovation as well. Mm -hmm. Right now we're talking about projects like Finest Bay Area, for example, you know, uniting Helsinki to Tallinn, which means that you know, people to Narva can navigate and to Tartu can navigate also from you know, Helsinki. So these things are going to be changing dramatically in a decade. So into our application, I think we, sh we should consider all of those aspects as well. What so happens to Tartu or Narva if you know, Helsinki and Tallinn are going to be united by a railroad? basically. Yeah, so we need a hyperloop to, to Narva. Hyperloop to Narva. Yeah. And uh, right now, the, the great thing is that, for example, the statistics in terms of Elron, which is the national yeah. train company, um, Narva is such a growth route. In 2018, uh, the travelers from Tallinn to Narva have been growing one, uh, 111 uh, 111 percent within a year so that's the growth trend towards Narva already which means most likely there will be trains added and Narva to Tallinn airport is two hours away which okay. is exactly how far you know Helsinki is from it, Turku. It is certain that, that, that there has to be a demand there has to be a demand uh, uh, from people who either live there or, or want to go there and that also involves Tartu. Hmm. More inhabitants more, uh, means more demand, more guests, uh, uh, more attendance to cultural events uh, means more demand mm -hmm. and, and hopefully better connectivity. But it can't be that bad, we get away from Tartus uh, quick enough already now so we can uh, come back as quick. A question? Okay, I'll ask the last question myself. Just add oh, no. to, you asked uh, how did the application or already, or did it change this yeah. si situation? Maybe just one field, uh, namely restaurants, mm. gourmet restaurants. Uh, that was something that changed already um, when we got the nomination and has continued to, to grow as a field. Uh, private uh, chefs and, and restaurant owners dare to establish restaurants to culture capital or city that was nominated because they expected um, extra tourists. But uh, what is very, very happy and wonderful to see is that that has remained as an impact because uh, that was a year when, when also the local inhabitants learned to use more public spaces, go to events and, and go to restaurants uh, for good food and therefore that has been one of the long-term impacts, I would say. Um, you, um, I would like to ask as a last question from Berg that uh, you wrote in in uh, in a newspaper in in spring an article where you were somehow trying to um, uh, pump energy into Dartu people, saying that uh, that all is not yet decided, that there is this feeling that everything is decided and apparently decided for Narva. No, uh, no I mean, this was what, what, the, uh, what, the, what the article hinted at. Why is there such a uh, feeling uh, in Tartu or maybe even in Kurasar? I don't think it's, it's there anymore. I mean, that was in the very early stages in the process where people were paying attention to uh, what happens in local media. And I think the awareness of how a process works has been uh, grown since then. And the awareness of uh, what actually matters is how good your bid is, and how well you defend it, and how credibly you defend it. And uh, I think it has to do uh, with uh, people being involved in the process, and getting the idea that it depends on them as well. How, how well the, the result turns out. Okay, last words to Helen, 45 seconds. About what? <laughs> uh, if I think if Narva is going to win or no, what? No, no, just uh, no I think uh, seriously, I, I think it, I'm really happy that now we have a competition of three. Right, Kurasar is in it. So, so I, I am a believer in competition, making all the contestants better. And I am in the believer that if whatever, whoever of us wins, we can all in the end, you know, line up behind supporting uh, whichever the town is that's going to be the winner. So, I mean, 
during the process we can already collaborate and we do and we always will so that's uh, the beauty of a small country anyway right great <laughs> and the last words to Kurasara. Uh, yes, I just also wanted to say the same actually that we will be uh, very happy on behalf also Dartu and Narva uh, if they will win. But of course Kurasara will have also very good bid and very good proposals. So, and it, it's very nice to have this competition with uh, very strong cities. So we'll see. Thank you and applause for the panelists.